Thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm at the Four Seasons Hotel here in Kuala Lumpur or KLCC. Uh, joining me is Michelle Natur, the uh, Managing Director and Global Head of uh, Islamic uh, Division of uh, Fitch Ratings uh, here to attend the Asset uh, Award and of course uh, to talk about the latest issuance uh, of all the non-rating uh, commentary that they have issued regarding Islamic finance demand being affected by Sharia awareness, sensitivity uh, and confidence in offering. Bashar, thanks for taking, uh, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. I want to talk more about uh, the uh, press release that uh, was done on uh, August 15th about Sharia awareness. Maybe you can talk more to that effect. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Always a pleasure. I think uh, um, awareness, confidence, Sharia sensitivity and product offering is, is key drivers or limitations to the growth of Islamic finance in general. And in, in that uh, commentary, we tried to summarize how does that really pan out and plays in the bigger picture. Uh, if we zoom in, in into each of these, uh, I think the first step is to be aware that there is something called Islamic finance. Although that's not the case in Malaysia, because here you have uh, more than 40% of the financing done in Sharia, more than 60% of the debt capital market in Sukuk. But in other uh, Muslim countries in the OIC, 57 countries, that's not the case. So I think awareness is one of the key drivers and key limitations to the growth of the industry, i.e. Uh, knowing that there is something called That's Islamic something finance. that I want to touch upon because with Islamic finance in Malaysia, it's taken for granted. People argue that you know, it's a default kind of thing unless a particular structure cannot uh, support a Sharia uh, kind of setup, you go for conventional. But clearly, this is not the case uh, globally, as well as in other markets, especially markets that are predominantly Muslim markets, like Indonesia. Why do you think it's still uh, hesitant for these kind of markets to adapt uh, or adopt uh, Islamic finance? Excellent. I think that's a very fair question. The drivers uh, can, if, if we are to put them in categories, regardless of awareness, confidence, and what have you, it's top-down and bottom-up. Top-down means you have a government that has a strategy to develop Islamic finance. They're putting the right frameworks, legislation, regulations, and even in some cases putting incentives to grow that sector. And that's top-down, i.e. you have a government that is pushing that. Bottom-up, you actually have an actual demand for the product. Now, in most cases, there is these two. One of them may be stronger than the other, or both of them weak, or one of them is weak and one of them strong. In the case of Malaysia, and more than, for, for more than a decade, that was actually the case. There was a strategy with milestones to promote Islamic finance, Islamic finance first, uh, having it uh, 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 in being embedded within the system, actually putting incentives in some cases, and this is why you have that growing here. In other countries, that's not the case you don't even have the legislation and the re regulations and frameworks to allow Islamic finance to operate. But it's 2023. This thing has been around for like half a, de half a century now. Why do you think that's the case? Is it less of a top-down kind of an issue, more of a bottom-up where demand from customers, both corporate as well as retail or government for that matter, is not necessarily there? There is no one Islamic finance. So Islamic finance is relatively 50, the modern form of it is 50 years old the start of it, but it did not start in all countries at the same time. So it started in Malaysia early in the process. It just started in some other countries. So if you look at uh, 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 Nigeria, for example, and I'm talking about big uh, Muslim population countries, if you look at um, Indonesia, if you look at Turkey, that is something that's not, it's not, has not been adopted 50 years back. Mm. But it's not only Islamic finance. So you have to bear in mind, it's the development of the financial sector. It's the development of the debt capital market, let alone Islamic finance. So the actual development of the financial sector and the Islamic finance, i.e. going the extra mile for Islamic finance, is really what is uh, limiting or driving it to, to go faster. If you dig deep into that, then the factors that we talked about uh, top down and bottom up pan out. If we look at the demand, which is the bottom up side of one, awareness as we discussed is, is important. The other thing is confidence, because you will have some Muslims saying, okay, I don't think this is Sharia. Yes, you can have a fatwa, but I think it's similar to conventional. And you have the other uh, issue of it, Sharia sensitivity. You will have some saying, okay, I mean, I don't think I'm very sensitive for this being halal or haram, as long as I'm getting the best service. Mm. So there is, it, it, you're dealing at the end of the day from, with demand. Mm. And if you're talking about banking and retail banking, it's individuals 
demand. So having the product available is not just going to do it for you. Mm. In, in this particular uh, press uh, release, it, uh, it is argued, or Fitch ratings argue, that supply drivers also influence demand. This includes enabling regulations for Islamic finance, political will, and viable business model. That whole sentence is actually quite critical when yes. you talk about uh, political will, viable, profitable uh, business model, and the like. Is there no political will in these markets? No, exactly. So, so political will varies significantly in, in uh, Muslim countries and even in non-Muslim countries with sizable Muslim population. Because you, the, the, the starting point is having the right environment that allows you to operate, let alone, let alone having incentives, but just being allowed to operate. Because as you know, Islamic finance would require specific transactions that have contracts like selling and buying. Mm. And if you have the extra tax, for example, on that, it's going to kill the industry. Yeah. If you have the other limitations of not being able to transfer the assets, whether actually or virtually, that's going to have an implication on the industry. So that's the starting point. So it, not having a, an environment that allows you to operate, that's the first limitation. But that's not all. You need to have, in many cases, at least a, 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 a a similar footing with the conventional. So in many countries, Muslims and even non-Muslims countries, you don't have that. So you will go there, okay, we gave you the legislation, but do you have access to liquidity from the central bank? Do you have uh, the right product offering? Do you have the same uh, uh, instruments and tools available from you, from, from your regulator to allow you to operate. Mm. And that's many, in many cases, not the case. And this all is political will. Mm -hmm. So all of this, to have that set up, frameworks, legislation, regulation, if you don't have a, a, a government or a, a, a governing body that allows this, then that's not going to start. Malaysia is a, a very interesting model to be replicated. Uh, we started off with uh, tweaking the uh, Financial Services Act. Now we have the Islamic Financial Services Act. Uh, we saw an easy entry in the debt capital markets, the development of Suku that took place about 20 years ago now. That was an easy way in for markets to so adopt Islamic finance. Later on, did we see uh, Islamic retail finance taking place, Islamic private equity and many more. Do you feel that this kind of argument is actually quite better for markets to adopt if they truly want to adopt Islamic finance in earnest, maybe in Indonesia, for instance? Malaysia has been looked at as a model. And it is definitely on a local and national scale is, is, is uh, the most evolved one. But I don't think we've seen like a full adaptation or, it can, can, I mean, usually you will not have a country say, okay, I'm going to replicate that. Mm. They might benefit from it. They will see some of the experience of it, but they will have their own models that mm. they operate in. So mm. even countries like Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and UAE, they have their own models that are different to Malaysia. It does not mean that they don't see and say, okay, they're leading in that axis. But you have to bear in mind, the Islamic finance story in Malaysia is national. It's mm. not international. Yeah. Malaysia is not a hub for Islamic finance. No. Well, we want to. But exactly. That, that was an aspiration. Yeah. But it did not materialize on the ground. Yeah. There is effort. We, we might see more efforts coming f on that direction and more push. But that's not yet the actual fact. So you have to bear in mind that at the end of the day, there is a success story. But that success story is national. There is People do look at that. But each country, to be very honest, they have their own model. Let's tap into your wealth of experience to ex actually uh, forecast what the future is going to look like for Islamic finance. You've been around for more than, what, 20 years now in terms of this space. Fitch Ratings is actually the forefront in terms of giving uh, ratings for uh, Suku. Um, and uh, these kind of developments is actually quite crucial for us to tap into. It's 2023. We're now more than halfway there. What will 2024 bring when it comes to Islamic finance on an international level? Is it more of the same of the past 10 years maybe? Or do you feel that there's some markets that might be interesting? Some segments, is it debt capital markets? Is it something else? Do you feel that there's going to be a hyper growth area? And which geographies are going to benefit from this hyper growth? Okay, that, that, that's a basket of questions. It, uh, tap into your crystal ball. <laughs> okay, so then, uh, let me try. So I think the best way to look at it, I think, and that's a very good question, in the medium term, I think maybe focus on the top three. The trend that we saw of sustainability and ESG and Islamic finance trying to have the similarities being explored uh, further, it's not identical, but the similarities, uh, so I think that trend is, is going to continue and we're going to see it in the coming uh, I would say three to five years and 
if it's successful, it might grow first. So that, that is one trend. The second trend is we might see entry or more entry of non-Muslim countries into the Islamic finance. There is talk from Mexico to explore issuing a sukuk. There is talk from the Philippines trying to explore issuing a sukuk. These are highly Catholic countries. But exactly, so the motivation and, and, and the actual objective of that is to diversify their funding and tap into the Islamic investor, mainly in the GCC. Yeah. So there is, the objective is not always to develop Islamic finance, it's a financial tool at the end of the day. And if it's gonna, so we've seen this year, uh, the first non-bank financial institution issuing a sukuk from the US. That's rated by us. So it's not only uh, Islamic countries, it's not only uh, Islamic corporates or Islamic banks, you have the variety that is entering. And I think that trend, we will see more of it. Is it gonna be a substantial part of the industry? Is, is not that continues to be a question mark, but it's definitely something that worth also noting and looking at. I think the third one is looking at the development of Islamic finance in Muslim countries uh, or in Muslim majority countries where you see the actual discussion that, is, that happened in Malaysia a few years back starting to happen in these countries. People are becoming more aware, they have access. And that could be actually accelerated by the FinTech initiatives and having a better technology infrastructure, which allows access to, I would say, a more uh, simpler tool and form of, of Islamic finance that can be done uh, in the virtual world. So I think uh, these are the key three top uh, uh, things that uh, we are looking for and seeing how are they gonna be developing. You know, when I was doing uh, Suku in 2008, I, I just did a mental calculation in my head. That's now 15 years ago. It's unbelievable, right? Uh, that was a big conversation in terms of how the international uh, Sharia community views uh, Malaysian uh, Sharia uh, community. Uh, this whole talk of how uh, Babi Taman Ajil, for instance, uh, was a big problem for them, but it was cool for us. But then, of course, we realigned ourselves. We ensured that we are in tandem with what uh, the international markets are looking at, at least the international Sharia com uh, community is looking at. Is that kind of uh, conversation still happening in these various markets where there is a lot of friction among Sharia advisors, Sharia scholars, and Sharia boards? Standardization is definitely an issue that since I think you've mentioned, and even before that, and I think it will last with us for... Uh, for a, no, 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 just I, we don't know exactly <laughs> for how long, but it is definitely there. So having a, a, a different opinion of Sharia is definitely there, saying this is Sharia compliant, this is not. In Malaysia, that is less of an issue, at least within the national scale, because you have centralized bodies that says that. Yeah, Benagara, but in other countries, you don't have that. You will have an, a, an Islamic bank saying, this is Sharia compliant, and another Islamic bank in the same country saying, this is not Sharia compliant. I will not invest in that sukuk, yeah. or I will not be part of that syndication yeah. in this uh, Islamic format. I need that Islamic format. Yeah. And that is a key challenge for the industry, and I think that's going to continue. There are definitely bodies that are like AYOFI and yeah, like the IFSB, they're yeah. trying to do that, but adoptation and the way that it's adopted from one country to another differs. I have met individuals here, Islamic Bank CEOs, I will not name them, but they are militant against AYOFI uh, uh, and um, uh, IFSA and many more. So even here in Malaysia, they feel that the way they carry out their business is actually quite, I, I guess, not, not in their agreement. I, I'm, I'm not saying that they're right or wrong. I'm just saying that you can't get everybody to agree on standardization, yeah, but, even but in Malaysia. The, even if you agree, so you, I mean, you're absolutely right. Adoptation of that is there. But even if a country adopts uh, IOFI standards, it does not mean that the other country will adopt it in, a, in the same way. So a standardization yeah. and achieving standardization is something that is i think is is far-fetched i think what the industry has been discussing is harmonization at least having yeah. the same yeah. uh, uh, workable solutions to allow parties to be uh, working in a more smoother less complex less time consuming uh, way that is uh, I think viable for the various parties but that's not achieved I would say. Um, I'm gonna uh, take this conversation in a different angle in terms of ESG and sustainability and in the realm of impact investing. Uh, last month I attended an event uh, organized by uh, Khazana Nationals uh, CSR arm called Yayasan Hasana 
um, there uh, at the uh, KL Convex uh, Convention Center. And uh, the main theme of that particular uh, event was on how do they measure impact investing. Uh, one organization would argue this way, the other organization would argue another way. So uh, uh, growth in terms of societal uh, impact uh, or the number of human beings affected by that particular impact investing. And one uh, speaker said something interesting. He said that, um, it's she, pardon me. She said that uh, for the current accounting standards to achieve what it is today, it took 200 years. You know, today, when you say uh, key matrices like EBITDA and uh, uh, ROI and uh, you know, uh, IRR, it took 200 years for us to agree to these kind of, not just harmonization, but standardization. And therefore, she's trying to give some form of, form of premonition that at least for uh, ESG and CSR activities, especially in PEC investing, it might take a long time for them to arrive at that particular standardization. Do you share this kind of sentiment where it might take a very long runway for us to achieve some sort of harmonization and standardization because we've seen how it got to accounting uh, standards and now it's impacting the ESG measurement. Is it going to be the same for Islamic finance? Uh, it's, I, definitely it's the same, but there is few points that, are, that might actually act in the favor of Islamic finance. So if, if I am to look at ESG and sustainable and, and look at it from an Islamic finance lens, I can divide it into three categories. One is uh, positive, one is neutral, and one is, one is negative. Okay. The positive one is the negative filtering. So Sharia already starts with saying, okay, you cannot do gambling, you cannot do alcohol, you cannot do pornography. Uh, tobacco, you cannot do. So that's there. It's, yeah. it's already embedded. Yeah. So they've already bridged uh, a gap there. Yeah. That's the positive. The neutral one is actually going the extra mile for impact. Not having uh, uh, alcohol or tobacco does not mean that you're green or blue or sustainable. You need to go the extra mile similarly to conventional. And that is developing in various uh, speeds, I would say, in various countries where Islamic finance is active. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is the neutral side where you have similar footing of conventional. The negative one is on top of these two, so even if you achieve one and two, you're not yet Islamic finance because the actual structure needs to be structured in a Sharia compliant way which is an additional, I would say, mile that you need to go and cross to have the uh, Islamic finance layer on top of that. And that usually entails additional cost, it entails additional time, and that is something that itself needs standardization and harmonization, as we, as we just discussed. Mm. So it's an additional layer of complexity to go that mile. So I think with, with all, and all in that, what we've seen so far, in many countries where Islamic finance is active, and I mean top 10 countries like GCC, like Malaysia, Indonesia, when there is an ESG issuance or sustainability issuance, more than around, let me say, around 50% of that came on top of uh, Sharia, mm. so Sukuk. Mm. If you look at the actual percentage of Sukuk in the, uh, in the top 10 countries of the funding mix, it's 30%. So here we're talking about around 50, 30, so it's more. So it's doing, I would say, a, a more accelerated move when it comes to the EG, ESG of sustainability because of the negative filtering mm. and people being aware of commonalities mm. and they don't want to lose the Islamic investor. They want to add the sustainable investor. So I think it's moving in, 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 a, in a pace in these countries where it's developed that is faster uh, pace, but it does not mean it's an easier uh, channel to go through. Okay, uh, final uh, area of uh, exploration I want to go through with you is in terms of uh, new products and new services mm. that might not have been thought of yet or is currently in the nascent stage, I suppose. Uh, maybe you can share with us to that fact in terms of where Islamic finance is targeting, not just the traditional DCM stuff, but new stuff. Okay, if, if we look at that, that's a big question by itself. So, so uh, if you talk about fintech, crowdfunding, uh, venture capital, you will find the discussion finding its way to Islamic finance also in the same way. Now, the, the issue is in many jurisdictions, I think Malaysia again here, you have a better infrastructure when it comes to fintech initiatives and what have you compared to other OIC and countries. we have a fintech sandbox. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Dubai, DIFC have, I mean, yeah. Dubai has, there yeah. is other countries, Saudi Arabia is also yeah. venturing, but that's few countries. So if, I like always to say, okay, Islamic finance is present in 70 countries. Uh, there, is 57, yeah. there is 57 OIC countries. Yeah. Maybe a quarter of the population is Muslims, but Islamic finance is not a quarter of no. the financing. It's not that significant. So the way to go is very long. So I would say these things could accelerate uh, uh, Sharia. However, you have to bear in mind 
that you also need to cross the uh, Sharia clearance. So having a cryptocurrency that's Sharia compliance is a challenge by itself. Having cryptocurrency, let alone being Sharia, in many of these countries is an issue. But on top of that, is it going to be Sharia or not? Is it going to be creed of Sharia or not? So that is, uh, I think, a venue that if uh, opened uh, in a larger scale could actually escalate. Uh, uh, escalate to the, the way that Islamic finance is acting. So that is, I think, one of the things. Crowdfunding in initiatives also is a, another venue because it also has more of uh, profit and loss sharing, which is more uh, in line with Sharia. Uh, if you're looking at venture capital, also you're looking at profit and loss sharing, and that is something that is also embedded in Sharia. I think Malaysia started just a few years uh, back uh, talking about maqasid al-Sharia, and trying to explore that and seeing how to implement that in Islamic finance. There, these initiatives and the way that they are going to move in the future could shape the new Islamic finance industry, but that's not the case now. So the, the, all of these things continue to be a small part of the industry now. We're still with the uh, big uh, Sukuk and Islamic banks. Is this going to be the new future or not? I think that's a big question to be answered. What about uh, Islamic uh, finance in venture capital? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? I think the venture capital in many Muslim countries is still yet not developed, let alone Islamic finance. Um, many could argue saying that the gist of Islamic finance is, is profit and loss sharing. So Mudaraba contract, Musharaka contract. They With are, the LPs, you mean? Exactly. So, so it is in line, so, so the, the, the concept is not very far of having that in terms of the risk. But if you need to see how it's implemented on the ground, let alone Islamic finance, you don't yet have the right regulatory framework that allows these. You don't have the investor appetite, and that's key, that wants to go in that in Muslim countries. So I think at the end of the day, even if you have a demand for it and you have a good product, but you don't have an investor appetite or a viable business model, these and things are not going to fly. Uh, press release uh, on 15th of August. So therefore, you think that these kind of products, nascent products, might take some time in terms of uh, Islamic finance adoption? They, they, yes, they will take some time. Some of these issues relate to, to where Islamic finance is active, and others relate to Islamic finance industry and going the extra mile to make it Sharia. Okay, so you're here to accept the asset award. Uh, maybe you can talk more to that fact. Uh, I mean, it, it's uh, always a, a pleasure to be recognized, I mean, at the end of the day. It's the seventh year running, if I'm... Yes, you, it's yeah. the seventh year running. Uh, there is a lot of effort f uh, from within Fitch, within the Islamic Finance Group, within the broader groups, whether on the business development, media side, marketing, operations. So it is a good time for me to say thank you all for all the efforts that you've done. And of course, for our stake, holders who are uh, they're tr interesting us with providing independent, uh, transparent opinions across the board. Now, you've uh, actually seen all the markets that you operate in, um, and uh, the market that you know uh, quite deeply, actually, is, of course, Malaysia. In Islamic finance is a passe kind of thing. Uh, we take it for granted. Everything is Islamic first, unless otherwise stated. Even our uh, impact investing is mostly Islamic finance first before uh, conventional is being thought of. Do you feel that this is a situation that Malaysians are now taking way too much for granted? Because uh, just before we did this interview, I'm like, are, are we still think, talking about Islamic finance? Because quite frankly, in Malaysia, it's not. It's no longer there. It's everywhere now. That, that, is, um, that is actually a very important point. Because here, it is normal to see walking into a bank being offered a Sharia compliant product. First. That let alone first, but being offered a Sharia Oh, I see. Okay. Exactly. See, this is what I mean. Exactly. By, so, yeah. so, so, exactly. So here, you're offered Sharia compliant first. In other countries, even if you go to the bank, you'll not even find the conventional side uh, product offered. So the actual banking industry is not developed. But even if it's developed, you want to go, okay, I want to deal with Sharia or Islamic finance. That's not there on the table, let alone first. Mm. And I think that is something that is in, in I mean, if, if I am to call... Islamic finance being systematic, important, Islamic banking, it's around 15 countries. And the remaining are still at an early stage or not even started yet. Mm. So I think it's, it's definitely a more evolved ecosystem when it comes to Islamic finance um, in Malaysia compared to many other countries. It's not the actual case. There is a lot of steps. Of course, there is countries, so if you look at Saudi Arabia, mm. around 85% of financing is Islamic finance. Mm. 
Kuwait 45%, uh, Qatar, UAE 30%, Bahrain is uh, more than 30 if you're looking at a local level. There are countries that are, but you have also big Muslim populations in Indonesia, in Turkey, and I'm citing the big ones, Nigeria. And, and I mean, Turkey and Indonesia, you're talking about 10%. Mm. Nigeria, you're still talking below mm. three and four. So I think there is a long way to go. And the evolved uh, frameworks here in Malaysia is uh, definitely a model that is uh, unique. And it is, it is definitely the most evolved when it comes to standardization, regulations, and leg legislative uh, 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 initiatives that is supporting the Islamic finance ecosystem in general. I remember very clearly, as clear as day, uh, the central bank governor of Nigeria was in Malaysia in 2008 talking to uh, folks in this uh, country. I remember this very well because when I gave my card, Ibrahim Sani apparently is, is a Nigerian name. I'm like, I don't know, okay. Uh, and he says that let's just copy paste. That was the thinking there back then, 15 years ago. And, I, and, and clearly it's not going anywhere. Of course, the central <laughs> bank government has changed and so on. But yeah, what's stopping these markets from adopting? I think it, it, it's easier to answer. There is a lot of uh, things stopping them. It's easier to answer why it's, it moved ahead in Malaysia. Because you had the strategy with clear milestones from the top top down to achieve that and that was carried forward throughout the years so having a, 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 a continuation of supporting that strategy is what played in the favor of Islamic banking and Islamic finance in, in Malaysia that is something that we've talked about which is political will mm -hmm. so having a political will that is supportive is key to the success of the Islamic finance industry in wherever it is final comments before we conclude the conversation Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure talking to you and uh, hopefully we will see more and more of uh, initiatives that uh, uh, worth following and uh, yeah. talking about. Being, being adopted actually across <laughs> all the markets. Thank you very much. That was Bashar Nato, the uh, global head of uh, Fitch Ratings, also the managing director of Fitch Ratings. You want to learn more, just head off to all our conversations like this that can be found on astro I'm Ibrahim Sani signing off for this particular episode.